Following the completion of her residency, Dr. Beverly was appointed as an assistant clinical professor, and she is currently the director of radiology here at Signal Pet. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Epperly. Well, good yep, afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I'm in uh, New York time here, so afternoon for me. Um, so excited to get to talk to you all um, about, again, increasing your confidence in thoracic radiographic inter interpretation. You know, I was a practitioner for eight years, and so hopefully this will um, give us some real practical um, pointers and hopefully get to practice a lot. Um, here you can see a, a nice image of a cat with pretty horrible asthma. So we will continue on. So some of the learning points that we're going to cover today. So um, really for thoracic radiographs, proper positioning um, and radiographic technique is paramount, much more so than for abdominal radiographs. And so we're going to chat about that some. Um, when it comes to thoracic radiographic interpretation, you just have to practice over and over and over again to, to really be able to pick up those 50-ish uh, shades of gray that, that we see in the lungs. And so um, we can't do that today, but we're going to practice a little bit. So hopefully that'll help. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you can integrate AI results into your uh, radiographic interpretation and diagnosis um, and how to increase your confidence. And then uh, fourth, don't work in a vacuum. You know, I thought when I left general practice and went to my radiology residency, I thought, yeah, I'm finally going to have all the answers right in front of me. I'm going to know what's going on. And that's just plain false. Um, as you know, the clinical suspicion and what you get from your physical exam and um, uh, is really going to help you prioritize what those those findings mean. Um, I'm also going to plug TFAST or ultrasound. So when I finished, uh, we didn't really put the ultrasound on the thorax very much. And now, man, uh, TFAST, putting your ultrasound on there is going to give you so much information that's really going to help you prioritize what you're seeing on thoracic radiographs. So, so please don't be afraid to, to use that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and jump in and do our first poll. So hopefully you'll go ahead and see this and be able to answer, you know, what is, what is your biggest struggle with thoracic radiographs right now? So you guys should be able to type in there and that should just pop up on the screen. It may show some responses. All right. So it should just come along here. So uh, evaluating heart size. Yeah, all of it. Confidence. Uh, consistent positioning, like that. Confidence, yeah, yeah. All right, what is, what is normal? I agree, I think, I think we'll, talk, we'll talk quite a bit about positioning and confidence, uh, and hopefully, yeah, brachycephalic dogs. Brachycephalic dogs are the, the bane of my existence as well, and, and mixed patterns in cats, so that's great, and, and lung patterns. So. So these are, these are all great, great points. All right, so I'm gonna pop ahead. And um, segue in just quickly into how Signal Pet um, can help with some of those things, right? So, so basically having, we have this uh, thoracic panel with some of these signs. And so as you're going through your interpretation, particularly when it comes to lungs, having another, um, some backing um, to decide, is that really a pulmonary pattern that's abnormal that you're seeing there or not um, is critical. So we'll talk about that as well. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, do a quick walkthrough of how to really quality assess or review a, a, and review a systematic approach to interpreting thoracic radiographs. And then we're gonna practice with some cases and some polls where you get to, to click on um, what you think's going on and then we'll do a lot of Q and A. So first, what, what is quality assessment? Um, and so this is, this is crucial. It's the first step is, you know, is the radiographic study of diagnostic quality? And again, I've, I've mentioned I was in general practice. Um, sometimes radiologists are, we can be a little bit of prima donnas and want things perfect. I'm, I'm talking about diagnostic quality, okay? So that means that the positioning is appropriate enough so that we can give you an answer, whether that's AI or a radiologist or your own interpretation, so you can make the right interpretation, okay? Um, you're also going to want to make sure you have the correct views um, and enough of the views. Uh, proper exposure is also crucial, and we're going to talk about that some. And then optimally on thoracic radiographs, you're going to obtain them on inspiration, um, but that's also not always uh, achievable in our patients. Okay, so here, here we go. We're going to look at a lot of pictures today because that's, you know, what I do all day long. Uh, so these are kind of textbook perfect position thoracic radiographs. They're clearly not the same pet um, since this is a dog here and a cat on the VD. 
But um, what I want you to first look at is the gray. Okay, so on our re digital radiographs, we should be able to see trabecular bone detail really nicely, but still see throughout the lung that we can see pulmonary blood vessels um, out to the periphery. It's not black anywhere, okay? And I still have grayscale in my abdomen, okay? So this, this, uh, this radiograph's appropriately exposed. Um, we also want to assess, uh, make sure we have all the thorax, right? So we want to have thoracic inlet and make sure we have the caudal extent of the lungs when we're evaluating our thoracic radiographs. And then as far as how do we decide, are they um, appropriately positioned, i.e. not oblique? So it's really handy to just look at the ribs, right? And make sure that they're paired and superimposed with each other and that the ribs heads, you know, don't extend dorsal to the vertebral canal, okay? Um, similarly, when we're looking at these uh, VD radiographs, right? We really want the vertebral column and the sternum superimposed. You can't see the sternum, okay? So I, I realize, um, again, I was in practice, this isn't always a reality. So how, how oblique is too oblique for us to answer a question? All right, so here's a couple of examples where obliquity is really going to impact how, how we can evaluate particularly the lungs and the cardio, cardiovascular structures as well as the mediastinum. So what are we looking at here, right? So when you have the ribs and they're dorsal to the spinous processes, that's, that's one of those times that you ought to send your, your technician back and say, now we got we to rotate you a little bit more here, buddy. Um, because I can't assess, and you can't assess, and, and AI can't assess, is the size of this cardiac silhouette appropriate, right? Also, if there is a pulmonary lesion, I can't tell where it is. Um, and then on this view, uh, the VD, right? So if I have the vertebral column, and you can see the spinous processes are coming off kind of sideways, and the sternum, they're not even in the same room, uh, that's going to be enough obliquity again. Sa same problems really around assessing mediastinal width, uh, cardiac silhouette shape, and any pulmonary lesions where they might be. Okay, uh, I'm just getting a message that you can't hear me. No, oh, Aaron, we can hear you fine now on this side. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, the cardiac silhouette, like I was saying, is there's uh, deviated over to the side. So these are too much, right? And so I, they don't need to be perfect, okay? Um, the other thing that we're going to be talking about, well, I'll jump to this next one, right, is this case. So here, here's a clinical case. Is this uh, radiograph diagnostically um, appropriate? Uh, so quickly, as you're scanning it, um, I hope that it highlights the fact that you should be thinking, yes, diagnostically appropriate, and, and that's pretty great considering that this dog is probably really, really struggling to breathe right now, right? So you've got this horrible uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, and so I want to be realistic about what we're dealing with when we're looking at thoracic radiographs. You're going to have patients who, um, you know, having a perfectly positioned radiograph in a dead dog doesn't really, you know, do you much good, okay? And we're also going to be fighting respiratory motion in these guys if they are dysmic. And that's, that's what we have to balance. Can we answer the question? And so in this, in a lot of cases, we want to discriminate between what's, what's making this dog try to die. And so a radiograph that's not perfectly positioned um, of a lateral view to say, oh, is it full of pleural effusion or is there horrible non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? I think that gives us a lot of information. We're not gonna be able to assess subtle uh, changes to cardiac silhouette size, other things um, in those cases. But I think we can still answer a lot of questions, okay? So, so this radiograph is definitely of diagnostic quality. And again, nice grayscale throughout the lungs. Here's the orthogonal in this case. Um, so this is a DV radiograph. You can see it's not quite as nice as the lateral was. Again, it still allows us to make the diagnosis and still see the increased opacity in the cotodorsal lung fields. Um, again, the sternum and the vertebral column are perfectly lined up and uh, allows us, you know, the, to at least say, hey, the cardiac silhouette's not huge, okay? We don't see pleural effusion. So again, this is of diagnostic quality, even though it's not perfect. Okay, so now we're going to review kind of a systematic way to evaluate. Um, sorry, my, instead of my, excuse me, sorry, guys. Let me just back something up. I apologize. Um, are you seeing that okay again, guys? You can see the image, Aaron, but I think it's, there we go. Now it's large on your screen. Okay, okay. I apologize. 
Technology is great. Um, all right, so when we're going to evaluate the lungs, um, uh, the, uh, how we look at the thorax. Okay, so very first, we're, I think we should start with lungs. And what's crucial um, to deciding what shade of gray is appropriate is looking at the expansion of the lungs. And this, um, I didn't realize this till I started my residency. And so if you think about it, right, what we struggle with so often is just that hazy shade of gray that's in the radiograph. And to decide if it's real or not, we really need to know, are the lungs tiny or are they big? Um, and so most commonly, we have patients who don't have completely inflated lungs. And so when that's happening, um, the lungs look too white. And usually that's artifact, that's some degree of atelectasis, okay? So we don't need to give that patient disease. It's just that the lung's not fully filled with air. And that's because we're battling that all the time in the lung as it's taking air in and out, um, the shade of gray is gonna change, all right? So we wanna see how big the lung is to help us decide if that shade of gray is appropriate or not. So then once we have decided, okay, the opacity of the lung or how inflated the lung is, then we still decide, hey, the lung is too white. I mean, that's, I, I like to keep it relatively simple. We go, okay, it's too white. Then the kind of different algorithms that you guys are very, very familiar with of how we break that down um, are, are typically structured and unstructured. And I had no idea until I became a radiologist just how um, crazy semantics were going to be and what different people were going to say. And that I think is one of the things that makes pulmonary uh, interpretation so challenging is just the variability of um, how, what we, how we call these lesions. And then alternatively, there are times when the, the lungs are too uh, hyperinflated or too black. And again, um, really feline asthma is the main case of that. So I'm gonna jump over to again, some of the terminology that you're gonna run into with signal pet, um, which is different from you know, different universities and different um, radiology services that you might use. So basically when I'm talking about um, Inter, uh, unstructured opacity, whether that's interstitial or alveolar. And remember, those are the same diseases um, that cause interstitial or alveolar pattern. It's just how severe, how much fluid or pus or blood is in the lung, how white it is, okay? Um, those patterns are going to be referred to as um, craniovantral, cotodorsal, parenchymal patterns, diffuse or patchy. And so as, as you guys remember, right, the distribution is really critical to how we prioritize what is going on. And so, so signal ray is really handy. It's gonna tell you, hey, it's craniovantral, it's cotodorsal, and that's gonna really help prioritize, oh yeah, that makes sense, this is, is a congestive heart failure, and no, this is, this is pneumonia. Um, and so that's, those are the signs, the signals that you're gonna get back from um, signal ray about that. Alternatively, um, when we're talking about atelectasis, um, it, it will run into this term, this bronchointerstitial pattern, which uh, radiologists really like to joke about, like everybody's got a bronchointerstitial pattern, um, because it really is a sign of either age change to the lung um, and some degree of incomplete expansion. And so usually when you see that and you get that signal back, it's not indicating that there's actually pathology there. Uh, a bronchial pattern. So you'll see my terminology is bronchovascular. And I just, I like to highlight that because there are other things besides just airway disease that will give you a bronchial pattern, right? And so that's why, you know, I was trained to say bronchovascular because the lymphatics um, and the pulmonary uh, vessels run adjacent to the bronchial walls as well. So you can get a bronchial pattern uh, sometimes with early uh, congestive heart failure. You can, you see the bronchial pattern um, with lymphatic spread of neoplasia as well. But those, those are going to be recorded as a bronchial pattern, which is the typical terminology. And then what about pulmonary masses? So, so you're going to see some pulmonary masses, pulmonary nodules, or you also might see this nodular miliar pattern. And again, uh, these aren't all the patterns in the world when you guys are talking about complicated pulmonary patterns, um, but nodular miliar pattern is going to catch you, you know, those um, carcinomas or hemangiosarcoma metastases, blastomycosis, those kind of patterns with all the little tiny nodules. So to highlight this, whoever has said, uh, break, uh, sorry, bulldogs, this is a bulldog, uh, it's under anesthesia, and this was uh, pre-op, it's gonna go for airway surgery, and of course, so we're looking for aspiration pneumonia, right? So what you see here is white lung, right? Well, what do you do with that? Like I told you, uh, you need to say, how big is the lung? Well, it's hard for me to tell, but I, my impression is kind of the margin of the lungs, these are pretty underinflated, there's a lot of fat down here. So, so what do we do? We decide, hey, let's, let's have anesthesia, you know, really give this dog some deep breaths, and this is what we get. And so now, voila, right? So now the lung goes all the way down to the ventral body wall, and that, that opacity went away. I mean, it's pretty striking, right? And so I like to show this, because this was more dramatic than I really believed could happen in real life, uh, in practice. And so you can see that, yeah, now this dog doesn't have aspiration pneumonia, it just had wee tiny lung. 
So as we're going through with the thorax, we also want to evaluate cardiovascular structures. And I'm not going to go off through this. Um, you just want to make sure you're always evaluating the cardiac silhouette. And that in concert with that, you're going to evaluate pulmonary blood vessels. And we're going to you know, talk about that as well. Uh, I want to highlight, right, if you guys can feel really, really confident about about identifying left-sided cardiomegaly. You know, that's gonna be 90 plus percent for, uh, of the cases you're dealing with most of the time in practice, uh, and me too, um, because that's the diseases, those are the diseases that are most common. If you can be confident with that, that's really going to um, increase your um, diagnostic, your confidence in interpreting thoracic radiographs. I had a mentor who said, if you think you see right-sided enlargement, you're probably wrong. So um, this is, if you struggle with this, or you feel like you're overreading it, we all do too. Um, and so most of the time, you're not going to be seeing that. Obviously, it happens sometimes, but not that common. So here's just a, a textbook picture. Um, so if we're doing our algorithm um, and we say, yep, these are appropriately um, exposed and positioned, and the lungs are pretty well inflated, uh, and they're too white, right? You can see these air bronchograms um, ventrally here. Uh, and then also, kind of caught it dorsally here, uh, though I have to say, right, then we move on to cardio, uh, the, the evaluating the cardiac silhouette. And of course, there's a huge left atrium. This is a very, very large heart. Nice dorsal displacement of the trachea, kind of classic left atrial enlargement on the VD view with the bow-legged cowboy. Um, and then, uh, so this is a you know, classic case of um, left-sided congestive heart failure. It's hard to evaluate the pulmonary veins for distension in this case, and that's oftentimes the true with a congestive heart failure, right? The, the pulmonary opacity uh, faces the margins of the blood vessels, so we uh, can't see them. So there we go. All right, so next you always want to make sure you've evaluated the pleural space. Again, the, the go-to for that is making evaluating the lungs and seeing how far they go to the periphery of the thoracic cavity. I've shown you several times now talking about incompletely expanded lungs. So you see the ventral margin and you see fat in the pleural space ventrally. All right, it's probably just incomplete pulmonary expansion. Uh, so otherwise, if we see soft tissue opacity, then we're going to prioritize fluid. Of course, if there's gas there, we're going to call it pneumothorax. So we have a case here. Uh, you can see that the lungs are incompletely expanded, right? They don't really then get anywhere near the first rib. Uh, have kind of a round margin, maybe a little pleural fissure here. And then there's soft tissue opacity, soft tissue opacity. And we're going to look at that in a second. So then we have this guy. Obviously, you can see Different radiographic technique um, in digital radiographs, right? You're gonna run into all sorts of things. So this is a very soft algorithm, an older image, a very sharp, newer image, um, which is also one of those bugaboos for deciding what shade of gray is appropriate in the lungs and if it's pathology or not. So this lung is much better inflated. And I follow the line here and then I say, well, I got this white line. It's kind of like this white line over here. Is that pleural fluid or not? And then, so this is, this is a little trick that, um, helps me decide is there a little bit of pleural uh, fluid there or not. Um, so in this case, right, I just see soft tissue opacity, can't see the apex of the heart, can't see the diaphragm. Um, in this case, here we go, I come across, there's that white line. Oh yeah, here's this nice triangle of fat opacity. You can see the diaphragm, here's abdominal fat. So, oh, okay, so this one's under expansion, this one's pleural effusion. But what I'd really like to point out here is instead of agonizing over trying to answer this question, I would really, really love you to just stick your ultrasound on here and confirm that it's fluid or not. It's going to be way more sensitive um, and it's, you're not going to have to argue about you know, the positioning and is it just a fat dog or a fat cat or not. So, so use your ultrasound transducer. So then um, move on to the mediastinum. Again, so this is kind of a laundry list of the mediastinal structures that I'm going to evaluate. Um, so, I'm gonna look at the cranium mediastinum, I'm gonna look at the esophagus, I'm gonna look at the lymph nodes, I'm gonna look at the trachea. I'm gonna say, oh, can I see things better than I ought to? Yeah, if that's the case, then there's pneumomediastinum. Okay, so, so to highlight that, got this case for us to look at. You go, oh, look at that, there's a, there is a ton of pleural effusion there. There is no arguing that, right? So it's pretty nice. So, but I just told you that we were doing uh, mediastinum, so probably that means there's something more. So, but I, I can't tell that here, right? I can just say there's a ton of pleural effusion. Uh, but here, now all of a sudden, yeah, this is, this is a, a more stark contrast, right? And gives us more information. So a DV on this side, right? A VD on this side, same dog, didn't take any pleural effusion out of this dog, but look how much more information you get from that VD radiograph than you do from the DV, right? So now I can see this giant cranium mediastinal mass, right? That I, yeah, I could I could have a, su a suspicion for on the other images, but even if I compare here, right, the the cranial lung lobe on the left and the cranial lung lobe on the right, they they extend cranially the similar amount, 
even though this one, right, on the right, there's no mass there. So, um, and then I can see the margins of the cardiac silhouette nicely, which is another question we really want to answer a lot of times as we are, um, as we're evaluating a, a patient with pleural effusion. So this is me going in my soapbox again. What I really love is for you to put your ultrasound transducer on first and get all that pleural effusion out of there uh, before you even go to radiographs, right? It's gonna give you a lot more information. It's gonna help the patient. It's gonna make it easier for um, uh, obtaining the radiographs. Granted, I understand it's not always possible. Um, so make sure your patient's stable enough to roll on their back and take a VD, but you'll get a lot more bang for your buck with pleural effusion with a VD. So lastly, we well, gotta make sure we look at all the other stuff, right? So the body wall. So musculoskeletal structures, vertebral body, uh, diaphragm, make sure there's no hernia, um, the soft tissues of the body wall, especially for our, our patients who've had, um, you know, dog attacks and such, see how much subcutaneous emphysema and if it's communicating with the body uh, into the thorax. And then this is also when I'd evaluate the abdomen, make sure there's nothing going on there. All right, so another radiograph to take a peek at, clearly, a lesion again. So yeah, we can see this big mass and you're saying, all right, once again, so now we're talking about body wall. So it must be something, something different than just a big very opaque pulmonary mass. And, and in fact it is. So here on the orthogonal radiograph. So another plug for why it's important to get orthogonal radiographs to help you localize some of these lesions in space. Um, so in this case, this is a, a mass of the fourth rib here. And I might not be able to appreciate the lysis, but the rib just kind of ends end and then it doesn't continue to wrap around. Um, you can see the mass that extends outside the um, thoracic cavity and then into the thoracic cavity, displacing the cardiac silhouette. Uh, so this was a hemangiosarcoma of this fourth rib and this dog's alive five years later after a resection and um, chemotherapy there. So who knew, even though it was, was uh, touching the heart. So again, always make sure that you're evaluating all the structures, not just what you might be interested in. So on that note, we're gonna start um, going through some cases and, uh, and play around just a bit. So this is a, an 11 year old female intact chihuahua who's been inappetent, uh, no vomiting or diarrhea, but been having some hacking when drinking, some tachypnea, a high grade heart murmur, and then increased lung sounds. Um, she does have a mammary mass and a periodontal disease. So what I would like to do is I'll let you guys look at this one for a second. Um, so I have, this lateral, and then I'll give you an orthogonal and lateral, the other lateral together. Okay, we're gonna just click ahead and you can look at the orthogonals. Go through that process of deciding, are they appropriate? Look at the lungs and the hearts, all the structures. I'm gonna wait just a little bit more. Okay, so the first question that I would like us to answer is, are the image of diagnostic, are they diagnostic quality? So I'm hiding your responses for just a moment. So are they yes, they are, no, or you refuse to commit. And uh, you know that's a running joke with the radiologist, we don't commit to things. So, so maybe if you can't choose, you wanna be a radiologist. All right, so. You're, you're all going with mostly with yes. I got some, some future radiologists down there at the bottom, so that's excellent. Or maybe you are a radiologist already. Uh, I think there were a couple no's, but yeah, I think these are definitely of diagnostic quality. So uh, positioning's appropriate. The VD is really nice and straight. Um, the lateral is not perfect, but definitely diagnostic. So we're gonna move forward to the next slide. Um, and so in this case, what I'd like you to do is drop a, a pin um, on a lesion or on lesions. I'm gonna hide our pins for a second. So you should be able to put multiple in on, on something that you think is abnormal. All right, we got lots of pins, they're coming in. Usually somebody throws a pin off nowhere land. There you go. Maybe it's just challenging to try and throw them in sometimes. Okay, so we've got a lot of pins adjacent to the cardiac silhouette. We got a lot of pins on the cardiac silhouette. Excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna click ahead. All right, so that's, we, as we go through our process, we've decided, yep, these are, these are um, technically uh, appropriate. And so then we're gonna look at um, how well are the lungs expanded? Yeah, they're pretty well expanded. 
right? And then is there increased opacity? Yeah, there's increased opacity, right? As you guys uh, outlined very nicely, there's low bar signs and increased opacity, both in the caudal subsegment of the left cranial lung lobe um, and this beautiful, completely opacified right cranial lung lobe. You guys, so then the next thing that we look at is, cardio, is the cardiac silhouette and you guys um, put your pins in this big left atrium that's, that's poking up out here, right? And then this is part of the heart as well, the cranial margin and that dorsal displacement of the trachea. Uh, pulmonary blood vessels though, yeah. Yeah, they look pretty good, right? Now, see, this is caudal vena cava here, so that's always sneaky. It's sometimes it's tricky to evaluate the, the right caudal uh, lobar pulmonary vein because it summates with the caudal vena cava because that would be too big, but it's not. So there you go, cranial lobar vessels. So, so no signs of, of congestion. And, um, and then pleural space looks good, mediastinum. I had some pins on, on this, on what was going on up here, and this, uh, I think on the other image shows, it's, it's part of the thoracic limb that's superimposed up there, but good, good eye, that doesn't look normal. Oh, it says part of the thoracic limb and then the ends of the rib heads, I think is why that looks a little bit different. Um, and then mediastinal structures. Yeah, I don't see anything in the cranial mediastinum, trachea, besides being displaced looks fine. Um, nothing in the esophagus. Um, can't appreciate any lymphadenopathy and the body wall and the abdomen looks good. So, what do we think about that? So here's what the interface and what kind of information you would get, say, with, with SignalFed as you're going through that. So you've, you've outlined this increased opacity, and uh, you're going to see that, yep, you're going to get cranioventral parenchymal pattern, and it's going to have four bars that are red, which means AI is very confident that there is, in fact, increased opacity in the cranioventral lungs, which there is. You're going to have confirmation, right, that you don't have increased opacity caught a dorsally. And then there's another little bar that pops up here, um, if not on this screen, that captures a uh, vertebral heart score. Uh, and so you're going to, uh, right now, there's not a test for left atrial enlargement, though I'm sure it'll be very soon coming. Um, so a VHS, in this case, is going to be very elevated. And so that's going to be your confirmation that there is cardiomegaly. So if you had any doubts um, about was this congestive heart failure or not, um, you know, I think uh, Signal Pet's going to, um, or Signal Ray is going to help confirm what you were, what you're evaluating. They can see that this was, I'd crop the image for you guys to see, but you're also going to, you know, get feedback on the abdominal structures to make sure that you, um, you know, didn't, didn't forget to look at something going on with a kidney. And there's her little mammary mass there. So great. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the next case. Um, which is a three-year-old female spade husky mix who's been having bouts of difficulty breathing in the evening before bedtime. Um, she also is having some retching, but otherwise, you know, she's pretty normal on physical, normal lab work, and she hasn't been treated with anything. So here's her radiographs, and I'm going to let you guys take a, take a gander at those for a little bit before we make some comments on them. Okay, so are these radiographs of diagnostic quality? I'm gonna hide the responses for just a little bit and let you guys answer. You can see, now I can see a whole bunch of you answering. All right, let's see what you think. All right, so three quarters of you say no, a quarter of you say yes. We want you to see how we go there. All right, so I'm going to click ahead and we can chat about the decision. So, so I, I'm going to tell you that the answer is no in this case, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, so the positioning is very nice, okay? And when I were evaluating, so if we're evaluating the laryngeal region and the, the trachea, this is all fine. But what the problem is here, yeah, let's see, we see a nice, nice bone opacity. We start scooching caudally. And all of a sudden we got these black areas. I mean, pitch black. There, there's nothing you can do here. It doesn't matter how much you window and level on your screen, you're not getting back any data here. Same thing along the lateral aspects here on this VD projection, okay? So what is that? Okay, so I, I didn't know, I share this because I, I, was, I had no idea what this was or was even looking for this when I, was, when I was in practice and I was trained on film radiograph days and digital radiographs have a whole different you know, box of, uh, of artifacts compared. So this is called saturation artifact. And it means that this radiograph, this portion of the radiograph in particular has been hyper overexposed, okay? So it, it just can't respond. And so it's just gonna be pitch black. 
Okay. And the problem with that is you can, it can actually lead to misdiagnosis. So the most common places we see it where it makes clinical implication is here in the thorax and then in the, the limbs, right? In the musculoskeletal structures. T take a look and see if you can find any radiographs where you can see the bones beautifully, but you can't see any of the soft tissues. Um, and that makes it, you know, you can lead, it can really lead to a misdiagnosis. Um, so anyway, so these are really overexposed. So what you want to do is see these and go, oh man, we really need to turn back our technique a whole bunch, okay? Um, and depending on where you're looking at them, you might be having your MAS, you might be jumping back several um, uh, orders of magnitude on your KVP, um, but these are, these are overexposed. Like I said, position is great. So then they, they identified that, I'm pretty sure, and took them these radiographs, um, which are less overexposed, but still overexposed, right? So we still have that black halo next to the heart, ventrally next to the diaphragm on both of these, the right and the left. And so if I zoom in, right, what is the concern here is, right, you could, you could easily see how you can confuse this for pneumothorax, right? Right, this is where we're looking. We've got this little line along the diaphragm. Maybe here ventrally, we've got pneumothorax. And particularly in this case, right, so I've got this husky, huskies are the poster children for spontaneous pneumothorax in Bola. And, and as you guys know, if you've had any of them, they present in all sorts of ways with really vague signs. And so this is one of those times where, hey, this overexposure really could lead to a, a substantial misdiagnosis. So um, that's why we had to do our quality assessment and you, you can't know unless you know. So watch out for overexposure. Here's the, again, the, the comparable VDs. So again, this is really overexposed. You're probably not gonna confuse this, right? You know the ribs are gone, but here it's just a little bit, right? So you get this little black line around the diaphragm, just enough for you to be convinced that there might be a pneumothorax there. Now there's other signs, right? The lungs go all the way out to the periphery, but it's hard because they're really blacked out. Okay, so that was my main point um, on that case. So the next case we're gonna talk about is a 14-year-old male neutered cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Um, so he has a stable two out of six left systolic heart murmur. He's had a recent onset of weight loss and he's had um, thoracic radiographs just as part of, his, part of his workup. So I'm gonna let you guys take a look at these for a little bit and again, think about are they appropriately exposed and what you think might be going on in them? And then we'll click on them. Are these, um, oh, I meant to, oh, there we go. Didn't update in between. <laughs> uh, are these images of diagnostic quality? Let you guys answer. Okay, let's see what people are thinking. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, overwhelmingly, there's a few no's in the bunch, and um, maybe uh, uh, I'll guess what you might be getting at because I'll make a comment or two. Um, all right, so yeah, I think these are diagnostic quality radiographs. I'm gonna pop forward. Okay, so the reason, the thing I wanted to point out here is please give me, put, put laterality markers on your images. It's really, it's, it's so helpful, so please do it. Um, however, in this case, don't put them on the body. You know, don't, don't put them over what uh, you, we wanna evaluate. Yes, I know, that's, that's a nitpicky, like radiologist prima donna thing, but I have had sometimes markers over something that I'm trying to look at. I'm sure you guys have too. Uh, it's frustrating. So, so anyways, that's what I want to point out here. Otherwise, you know, they're quite good. Um, I will say, and I, maybe this is what someone was, was getting at. We don't have all, sorry, my, my Google slides bar is always in the right part, but it cuts off just a little bit of the caudal aspect of the lung on this VD, you'll notice um, if I leave my marker away. Um, and then, yeah, so it doesn't go all the way to the caudal aspect of the lung field. But otherwise, pretty darn good. So now we're going to click on what we think is going on. Here we go. So click on a lesion and I'll hide your little pins. I'm gonna give you a second to drop them in there. All right, we got pins, we got pins everywhere. I love it. All right. Hey, okay, there's so, so many pins. We'll have to talk about them as we're going through. All right. I like what we've got. Okay. And I don't know if people are putting pins to tease me or not, but that's fair. Fair game. 
Um, okay, cool. So we're going to jump ahead and we will we'll talk about these radiographs real quick. All right, so we, so we had pins all over the place. So we already talked about what might be technically suboptimal. Um, so first thing we're gonna do, look at the pulmonary expansion. Yeah, I think the pulmonary expansion is, uh, is really good, right? Uh, and the lungs pretty much have normal opacity, but there's a couple places that uh, wasn't quite normal. So there's this, this little, little nodule that I think there were some pins on. Um, there was this area up here that I definitely saw some pins on. Um, I think there were some pins they were towards the mediastinum as opposed to the lungs here. Um, otherwise, I don't think there were other pins in the lung, all right, which, which I would agree with. Okay, those are the only places I, I see increased opacity. Um, then next, cardiovascular structures and, um, and pulmonary blood vessels. So yeah, I think there were, there were definitely pins indicating that yes, in fact, this heart is a little bit big, right? So there are signs of left atrial enlargement. Maybe there were some pins, I think, over towards the left ventricle, indicating the left ventricle is a little bit big. I don't know, I don't really see dorsal deviation of the trachea, but I'd say, yeah, there's a, there's a little, there's straightening of the caudal cardiac waist, a little bit of left atrial enlargement. So I wanna I want argue with where you guys were dropping your pins over here. So the, the lungs are a little bit big, uh, that lungs, <laughs> the heart's a little bit big. Uh, pulmonary blood vessels are, are super normal though, so, right? We don't have, we don't have any signs of, of vascular congestion. Nothing going on in the pleural space. Those lungs go all the way to the periphery. Uh, I don't see anything exciting. Um, I don't see anything particularly exciting. There were some pins in the mediastinum up here or in this region that I don't see anything. So I, I can't ask you what the pin was. There's this little thin line. Um, there's a tiny bit of gas in the esophagus, which oftentimes we'll see in our sedated radiographs. Um, so that might've been what the pin was. It's technically not totally normal. It's a good point. Um, this is one of the places where the mediastinum looks just a titch wide, um, but we have, you can see that the vertebral column and the sternum deviate just a little bit there, which adds to that appearance that the mediastinum is a little wide. So I don't, I don't really think there's any true mediastinal disease. Now, this could be, right, this could be a hiatal hernia. This could be a little bit of fluid in the caudal esophagus too, um, especially because right over here, I don't, I don't see anything. So I'm trying to make sense of that, that opacity. I'll jump ahead to this other one as well. Um, so don't, don't see that. Those are the things I'm thinking of. Uh, and then when we go around to the uh, body wall, yeah, I don't see anything super exciting on the body wall or in the cranial abdomen. There's a little fat opaque mass here, a little lipoma. And then these little guys that you guys put pins on, right? And I think as many of you who put pins over here know that that's why we don't see the pulmonary nodule. It's actually this body wall nodule. So again, another plug for orthogonal radiographs. Um, but now uh, to answer the question about this opacity. So in this case, right, we took the other radiograph. So that opacity wasn't, we don't have to play the guessing game of it being a hiatal hernia. Uh, in fact, it's a pulmonary mass. So this is again my plug for three views in the thorax. I'm not, I'm not a stickler for three views in the abdomen, um, but in the thorax, it, it does make a big difference. I mean, I like three views in the abdomen, by the way, as well. So that's the only additional finding here. Um, and then we did take uh, the, uh, the VD or the DV radiograph that included the caudal aspect and there in fact was that pulmonary mass. So here's me highlighting just this example of how you crop off just a little bit of the lungs and sometimes you crop the lesion right out. Um, again, not, not to be nitpicky, but it's just a nice example. This happened you know, clinically at the hospital um, where I was. So um, yeah, so there's that pulmonary lesion. So try to get all the lungs in. Okay, so the, the last case before we do some Q&A time um, is Margot. She was a 17 year old female spade, um, domestic short hair who had increased respiratory rate and efforts. Here's, here's one of her laterals, and then I'll give you the other lateral and a, a DV. I'm going to look at those for a little bit. Oh, I'm going to look at the other one because it's kind of the same. All right, so I'm gonna jump ahead and let you guys you can still see the images there, decide um, are they of diagnostic quality? Wah, wah, wah. Okay. All right, so majority of you said yes, uh, a couple said no, and uh, yeah, a couple also said depends on what I'm trying to answer. It's exactly right, and that's why it's such, um, I mean, they're all 
there, there's answers. These are all acceptable answers, right? Because it really does depend on the situation. This is a dissonant cat. Uh, these are pretty, to me, these are pretty phenomenal radiographs for a dissonant cat. Um, but, but as, as is pointed out, right? So this degree of oblique uh, obliquity on the VD is going to change how I perceive that shape of that cardiac silhouette uh, and how I perceive the lungs. And that might alter my diagnosis. And so, so yeah, am I taking these? Cause I go, okay, where am I starting with this dissonant cat? Or do I, do I already know things and I want a subtle answer? So there you go. I agree with that. All right. So now we're going to click on a lesion or lesions because you probably have noticed there's more than more than one in our friend, kitty friend. Oh, I need to hide the pins. You don't want to see everybody else's. All right. There they are. They're lighting up. All right. I like it. So we've got pins. They're going to explode. Oh, locked. Math, all the pins we can put in, which, which is fair. So there's a lot to talk about here, but definitely some, some areas where they are um, more accumulations of. So, yep, we decided they're not perfectly positioned, but they're pretty good for a dysmic cat. Um, the lungs are well inflated. Okay. And yeah, the lungs are too white. And this is one of those uh, to who mentioned cat mix patterns. Um, so I like to try and uh, simplify, but unfortunately, real life isn't always simple. So lots of shades of gray um, in this cat's uh, pulmonary patterns. So where to start? Okay, I saw there were a lot of pins up here on this little patch of nodules. So I agree. These are nice round pulmonary nodules. Um, yeah, there was one here, and I saw the patch on this little, this little patch uh, uh, as well. Then there were also uh, this whole area, right? Just caught the cardiac silhouette and summating with the caudal vena cava. This, this area has increased opacity, but what, what box do I put this in? This is, this is challenging, right? Um, there's definitely some lines. There's definitely lots of, of thick lines, but it's also fuzzy, right? You can see in this area where it's not as fuzzy, right? Just how fuzzy it is. Okay, but there's no air bronchograms. I don't see effacement, effacement of pulmonary blood vessels. So it's not really alveolar. So really there is some interstitial pattern here and some bronchial pattern, which is different than bronchial interstitial, which is just fabulous for semantics. But that's what we're seeing here. There's some increased opacity again, ventrally. Um, there's another increase in opacity. It's, it's, Hard to tell if that's structured or not, kind of over on this area as well. All right, so abnormal lungs for sure. So then we're gonna look at the cardiac silhouette. So it's a cat, cat hearts suck. Um, so what do we say? Well, the, the hearts, uh, cats, they get kind of a long heart. You know, they don't get a big bulge here at the land of the left atrium. And this is, it's a little bit long, but it's, it's not very big, right? So yeah, it's kind of equivocal on this projection. So this, to our degree of positioning, this is where my, my go-to, right? I want to see, does this heart look valentine shaped? And I saw you guys had pins on here as well. Um, so we've got this degree of obliquity. Is that enough to make it valentine shape? I, I don't see that making it base wide like this. So I, I call this real left atrial enlargement in this case. It's not a ton, but it's definitely there. Um, there were some pins on this little guy right here, and this is the, um, this is the aortic arch. And so this is a real easy place to get caught up and think there's a nodule when it's not, that saggy aortic arch right here summates right there and it looks like a nodule in cats all the time it's a, it's a real bug to be um pulmonary blood vessels blah, right i can't i can't see them in this case so that's not bad but but cats with congestive heart failure they can have unlike dogs who get pulmonary venous congestion which is nice and they follow rules you know cats can have normal pulmonary vessels they can have big pulmonary veins they can have big pulmonary arteries they can have both um it's all fair game in um congestive heart failure in cats so yeah that doesn't help me prioritize it there okay um so then we're going to move on pleural space. Yep, I don't see anybody in the pleural space. Uh, mediastinal structures, the rest of the mediastinal structures look good. Body wall, yeah, not, not super exciting. And then the abdomen, which I saw many of you put pins in, which is definitely not normal, right? So don't forget to look there. Totally absent cirrhosal detail. Can't really tell, you know, where the stomach is. So maybe the liver's big, maybe it's just all fluid, but it's, it's bad. So you got to identify that on your thoracic radiographs because that's going to warrant paying attention to. So um, what do we do with this information? So we've got dysmic cat, weird lungs, give them Lasix, please, right? No matter what, uh, pretty much now. Okay, I'm not gonna overstate that, but uh, cats do whatever they want when they have congestive heart failure. So if you're even entertaining that that's what it is. And also, yeah, put, put your ultrasound transducer on here and look at that left atrium. Um, so in this case, yes, that's what, what happened. So our kitty, now you got the lungs next to it after the, the Lasix. And in fact, 
pretty much all that interstitial pattern is gone. The bronchial pattern, yeah, so it, you know, we still have some degree of bronchial pattern. It's better, so again, that's the other caveat. Cats and dogs can get bronchial patterns with congestive heart failure as well, so why it was heightened was probably that, and then these nodules are still hanging out. And what does that mean? Well, she's got bad abdominal disease, so we're gonna prioritize these as metastatic nodules. Um, but, and we'll jump to another case. Um, oh, I'm gonna show you this one first, and then we'll talk about nodules and um, cat disease. So this is the pre and the post uh, VDs, uh, or DVs, excuse me, next to each other, just showing you that that, sh that shape change, okay? So we went from valentiny to not valentiny, okay? So yeah, the positioning's different, but it really does make that base wide area um, decrease. So yeah, the nodule. So here's another one, and this is the other reason to talk about and not say those are definitely mets, though. You know, they probably were in this cat. So here, here's a big fat cat, and it always makes the lungs look really, op really opaque. Um, but you can, hopefully, I can convince you, you can see all those thick lines and rings. And then similar to our last cat, little nodules hanging out. So in this case, this is a, a cat with asthma. Yeah, I can see those down here too. Now, this kitty has asthma um, and asthmatic cats. They get uh, mucus plugging and they get these opacities and they can look like linear you know, tubes, but they can also more commonly just look like nodules. So not every nodule in, in the kitty cat, especially if it has a, a bronchial pattern, is a metastatic nodule. So just a gee whiz, because um, I want to make sure we still have time for questions. This one is a cool one. So these, these are, this is more of the same. So this is a cat with asthma who has really severe mucus plugging, filling um, uh, dilated bronchi. So bronchiectasis filled with mucus, and then little tiny mineral opacities, so broncholithiasis. And this kitty um, also has a bronchial pattern, maybe little tiny nodules. And this one has FIP granul granulomas throughout all of the lungs. Um, which the pathologists tell me is pretty common in FIP. So uh, summarize of what we did there. Hopefully you realize I convinced you positioning matters. You gotta practice a whole bunch. You can see that AI is really handy to help confirm or to make sure you didn't uh, skip something in your process of going through. Uh, and then really use your clinical judgment and your, your ultrasound to really prioritize what's going on in the thorax. Perfect. Dr. Epperly, thank you so much for, for taking the time. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. We're excited to have future webinars with you around um, radiology. And, and lastly, we're very lucky and honored to have you as our director of, of radiology at Signal Pet. Um, and everybody will get their CE certificate um, via email, directly to the email here within um, 24 hours from now or less. Um, and for those of you who want to learn more about Signal Pet, you can go and visit us on our website at signalpet.com. And lastly, we're going to be having a future webinar uh, coming up with Dr. Gaines White, which is going to be actually just a quick webinar about how him and his medical team um, are benefiting from the use of AI um, at their home. Thank you, Dr. Epperly, for joining us and for everybody joining us today. We hope you enjoyed it, and we look forward to you doing Signal Pets webinars on radiology here in the future.